Well, welcome to those of you who are with us right now. Um, sun is coming out slowly but surely. So thank you for joining us on this formerly rainy Monday. Um, this is the second listening session for the Age and Dementia Friendly Project. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about social participation, civic engagement and communication and technology. Um, big thank you to Becky Bosch of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and Maureen Pollock in the planning department for helping to put this presentation together. And we are also going to be joined by some town staff. We have a community participation officer, Angela Mills, assistant director of diversity, equity and inclusion, Jennifer Moyston, and a remote participation from Brianna Sunrind of the um, communications department. And I'd like to just invite anyone who's here right now to put your name in the chat and tell us a couple of words um, regarding your feelings on communication, inclusion, and engagement in the town of Amherst. So if you could share your thoughts, um, it would be much appreciated. And I, and I think that about covers it, Becky. Thanks. Okay, I will share my screen. And um, since it's such a small group, um, and if, if you have any questions or, or you know, immediate thoughts, um, just interrupt me because I can't see everybody's face while the screen's up. Um, so as, as Haley said, um, we're, I'm gonna give a, a, a brief overview of the Age and Dementia Friendly Amherst Project, um, again, with a focus on communication and technology social participation and inclusion, employment and civic engagement. Um, and then we'll hear from some municipal staff on a few different programs and um, services that are there. Um, and since it's a small group, I think we'll just have a group discussion today rather than uh, doing breakout groups. Um, and then if there's time, I'll give some additional survey results. We also have, um, another uh, presentation that Angela may give on the community uh, participation officers. So why plan for an aging population? Um, the number of people over the age of 65 is projected to outnumber children under 18 by 2035 nationwide. Um, this is also a worldwide tr trend for many uh, countries throughout the world as people are living longer and having fewer children. Um, it's also estimated that one in three people over the age of 85 will have some form of dementia at the end of their lives. So that's why we're planning for an age and dementia friendly community. Uh, as we do this work, we're thinking about the domains of an age and dementia friendly community. This is a model that was developed by the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative. And it incorporates both the built environment, so housing, transportation, outdoor spaces and buildings, um, as well as the social environment. And that's really what we're focusing on today is the communication, uh, access equity and inclusion, social inclusion and civic participation. Um, we will have a future forum on, uh, future forums on transportation, outdoor spaces and buildings, and then the health and community, community services. Um, Population data, um, some of this is from the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative, but the most recent count according to the town census is that 13% or 50, about 5,200 people um, in Amherst are over the age of 60. This is up quite a bit from the estimates that we got from the American Community Survey, which said 10.7%. Um, and that number is, is increasing. Um, and about 8.3% or, or 3,300 people are over 65. Again, that number may be more um, according to the town numbers. And almost 26% of people over the age of 65 live alone. 13.4% um, are veterans and almost 12% have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or related to dementias. We did a livable Amherst community survey as part of this project to get some feedback from uh, older adults in Amherst. Almost 85% of the respondents or 875 responses total and almost 85% of people were over the age of 60, which is, was our target population or over 55. Um, and this represents about 14.3% of the over 60 population in Amherst. Um, and then almost 77% of respondents have lived in Amherst for more than 15 years. 
the survey respondents also were, were pretty close to the estimates for um, race and ethnicity of people over 65, according to 2016 American Community Survey data from the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative, um, with actually more uh, Hispanic and Asian um, respondents than, than the estimates showed. So that was great. We really wanted to show um, the diversity of residents in the community. Um, so communication, information, and technology, this, this domain actually spans a lot of the other domains because in, in order to, for people to know about services and programs, you have to have information on it and you have to know where to find that information. Um, as we all know and are experiencing still, um, access to technology has been really important over the last couple of years. Um, so that includes uh, connection to the internet, having the equipment and knowing how to use it, as well as knowing how to use the software. And also cybersecurity is important, knowing when to uh, not open an email. Uh, we wanna make sure that the, our formats are used for all users. So newsletters, using the phone, as well as websites and social media and local cable access TV is another good resource uh, for some people who don't use computers. Uh, we want to think about larger type for people who are visually impaired and equipment for people who are hearing impaired, if you have that in meetings. Uh, translation of materials to encourage participation by all residents. Um, and also thinking about how we talk about aging. So there's a, there's a movement called reframing aging or changing the narrative uh, to end ageism. And so that just means thinking about the terminology. So avoiding terminologies such as seniors, elderly or senior citizen and using older adults or older people, um, older workers, older athletes, younger people, um, just trying to, to avoid that, that terminology. Also avoiding ages Im imagery. So um, not using images that re reinforce stereotypes of decline and depression and dependence. Um, and using more age positive and diverse imagery. And there's actually um, a couple of websites that allow free use of uh, more age positive imagery that I can share later. Um, and then avoiding age storylines um, such as silver tsunami, gray wave, um, and being again, mindful of portraying older people as vulnerable and requiring protection. Uh, these are some a few survey results I'm going to share in this part of the presentation. Um, first of all, we asked if people were comfortable using computer, tablet, or smartphone, and um, most people uh, were. So almost 95% said they were comfortable. Um, we looked across the age ranges, and um, it did look like people in the older age range um, were a little bit less comfortable using technology. So 90 plus had the had the most. Um, there weren't many respondents under 40, so um, that may not be that's probably not representative of the total population. Uh, we asked if people needed assistance with using technology, and 9% uh, said they needed equipment, 13% said they needed training on how to use the equipment. 16% um, wanted training on how to use Zoom or WebEx or other video conferencing. And 3% said they weren't interested in using technology at all. So social participation and inclusion, um, think about activities for all ages, fitness and ability levels, um, having social and recreational programs for the whole community that are accessible for people of all ages, uh, programs that promote cultural diversity, um, having multi-generational interaction and dialogue and programs um, at times and locations that are convenient for older residents um, and supportive for people with hearing or visual impairments. Um, and then making sure that members of boards and committees reflect the population of the community. Um, some pro programming for people with dementia um, and, and their care partners include memory cafes. And I saw the senior center is, is starting to schedule those. That's an opportunity for people with dementia and their care partners to socialize with others um, with dementia. Also having support groups for caregivers and people with dementia. Um, memory kits are things that libraries sometimes offer with books and games. Um, for people at, at different levels of, of, of dementia um, and having, making sure staff is trained with how to work with people with dementia. 
Um, purple tables are when restaurants offer special hours or times um, or, or menus for people with dementia and their care partners. And then just overall community awareness of how to recognize the signs of dementia um, and how to communicate with people. Um, we asked if respondents had an impairment or condition that limits participation in community um, and almost 17% said that they did. Um, and those range from sensory impairments, about 35% or mobility impairments, 37% um, to chronic disease um, and psychological condition, um, memory loss or forgetfulness. Uh, we also asked this question of people um, if people were caregivers for other other people and the number of, of people who the people they were caring for was much higher with uh, with people with dementia um, in that question um, this is a guidebook we use sometimes for um, for doing this work the healthy massachusetts healthy aging collaborative developed this healthy aging for all um, guidebook and that is just to to consider all sectors of the population when um, developing initiatives for an age and dementia friendly community. Um, so across the top is all the domains of an age and dementia friendly community. And then on the left is um, various sectors. So age, behavioral health, country of origin, people with dementia and disabilities, economic security, just, just making sure that everybody in the community is considered when, when, you're, when you have a goal or initiative. Um, I'll just show this slide quickly. Um, this is 10 age-friendly university principles. Um, you, you know, Amherst is in a, has a great opportunity to partner with UMass um, and other colleges, Amherst and, and Hampshire, um, to, to really have age-friendly universities. Um, UMass is actually designated as an age-friendly university, but I, I have not been able to find um, <laughs> who, was, who was part of that. Um, but some of the principles include just making sure, encouraging participation of older adults um, in core activities, um, making sure that there's um, av availability for people to pursue second careers, um, looking at the range of educational needs and having intergenerational learning programs online educational opportunities um, and looking at the research agenda so um, making sure that's informed by the needs of an aging population. Uh, for civic engagement and employment, um, that includes engagement in developing policies relevant to the lives of older, older adults. So making sure again that the, um, those creating the policies are also the ones who are affected by them. Um, meetings at times and places that are accessible and convenient for older, for all ages, um, creating trainings for municipal boards that want to use volunteers effectively, um, having employment and volunteer opportunities for all ages, um, having intergenerational skill building and mentoring opportunities, um, and really fostering an age-friendly attitude in the public and private sectors. Um, according to the survey, 35% of respondents are still working full or part-time. Um, so people are, are working longer, you know, into their 70s and some even into their 80s. So something to consider, not everyone is retired. Um, many people are also volunteering full or part-time. Um, if you want to get into um, ways that businesses can become age and dementia friendly. The Age Strong Boston include, um, has developed this age and dementia friendly business checklist. Um, and that includes uh, completing trainings on communications on with and recognizing people with dementia. Um, it gets into buildings and atmosphere, communications, um, the outside environment, furnishings and colors um, on the inside environment for people with dementia um, and customer service. So it's a really useful checklist um, for businesses to use. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, so we now have some presentations from uh, municipal staff. And the first one is from Brianna. Um, and let me just pull that up. <laughs> so this is recorded. Unfortunately, Brianna was not able to join us today, um, but she did a recorded presentation and 
I am going to skip a section in the middle because it's a little bit long, um, but it's really useful information. So um, let me just share that now. Hello, everybody. My name is Brianna Sunred, and I was not able to be there with you in person today, unfortunately. Uh, so I will be sharing a little bit today on staying connected via communications and technology in the town of Amherst. Again, my name is Brianna. I have worked for over 10 years in local government communications, innovation, and digital services. Prior to working in Amherst, I served in the city of Worcester, which is the second biggest city in New England. I serve on boards on the international and state level regarding digital strategies, communications, and technology in local government. I am also an Amherst resident and live in North Amherst with my family and Corgi. So quickly, uh, and for a little context, Amherst, um, as many of you probably are very well aware, updated its charter. Um, we went from a representative town meeting form of government to a 13 member city council form of government with a professional manager, effectively creating year long legislative governance here in town. I think it's an important note to make because with these changes, uh, came an increased focus on transparency, participation, and engagement. And those were baked right into the Amherst's new charter. Um, and as such, a role called the Community Participation Officers, which you may have already heard about from one of my colleagues or will soon in this presentation, um, was tasked with being created um, due to the updated charter. And in our case, the town manager uh, appointed three members of existing staff um, to perform this function in addition to their other duties and that's myself and my colleagues Jennifer Moyston and Angela Mills. So with that being said Amherst continues to build capacity and strategy in these areas. Uh, this was escalated and impacted by the pandemic in different ways which I'll talk a little bit about in the next slides um, and we're really just trying to build an ecosystem for continual improvement through open communication. And to do this, we need to show the work we are doing and accept feedback and critique and use them to improve our service delivery and offerings. And really, as you can see, and as you know, our purpose is the public. So why do we communicate our services and performance in local government? Our goals should always be connected to, informed by, and to the benefit of our public, which is uh, all of you. We aim to increase transparency by telling our story and exhibit the value our services provide back to the community members who make it all possible. And lastly, we need to be using this feedback to improve or pivot, especially with specific audiences such as the senior population and how they navigate systems and information. So before I talk a bit about some of our technology and um, innovation, I think it's worth mentioning how the pandemic really paved the way for rapid innovation in local government. Uh, local government hadn't always been known as cutting edge, uh, but we had to adopt new technologies by staff and the public quickly in order to maintain um, our services and maintain our um, access to information for the community. So there were a lot of creative use and scaling up of existing technologies. It fostered a mindset of innovation, upskilling of teams. It was easier to attend meetings and join boards. And we saw participation um, increased and diversified in many cases. We were recording all of our meetings where we hadn't been before uh, for the on for online for public consumption and also broadcasting them live, whereas we were only doing that for a handful of um, major boards. And we got some really solid data and analytics on the use of our digital services and virtual engagement during this time, which we didn't have before. So in Amherst, I've utilized several new or existing tools to help tell our story of our work and services um, and highlight opportunities for two-way communications with our community members so we can get this important feedback on our performance. 
Um, so how we use technology to increase in communication, engagement, and transparency in local government. Uh, some recent examples, I'll, I'll talk quickly because I know I don't have um, much time here, but I'm happy to answer questions later on. Uh, so some recent examples are the digital signage that we're piloting in town through the end of this year. It offers uh, passersby the ability to text in to some of our polls and share their feedback with us. We've used crowdsource mapping for blight and issues. Uh, we utilize data and mapping tools from our issue reporting um, suite, see, click, fix, if you see a pothole. Um, you can drop a pin on a map and let us know where it is so that we can head out and fix it. We've utilized story maps for telling uh, about telling community about the process for, for a budget and our American Rescue Plan Act projects. We have a, a new online public participation platform called Engage Amherst, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. We've been developing public interest technologies with the university and deploying and testing them in town, uh, mostly around engagement during meetings and sentiment uh, gathering on important topics. We've been exploring perform performance management software and uh, the ability to put some data forward in public dashboards. We've expanded our um, assisted listening devices in our physical meeting rooms and that'll obviously become important once we go back to in-person meetings and another example is an audio i uh, tool for our website which is helping us to reach compliance with the americans with disability act uh, standards so i meant and and I'll say Oops. Sorry about that, it's getting it's Well, well, we got stuck. <laughs> um, I was trying to fast forward a little bit, but um, we will post this video on the website. Um, I think you probably get get the idea of of what the town is doing. Um, it's a really it's a great presentation. It gets into some more detail about specific projects. Um, but I think we'll hold off because my computer is still churning. <laughs> um, and I'm going to move on to um, Jennifer's presentation. Um, so let me just bring that up. We also have here um, Angela Mills from the town office, who is one of the um, communication um, or the community participation officers, and she is here to answer questions since Brianna couldn't be here and also has a presentation if people wanna hear more about that program. So let's see. Okay, Jen. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Moist and I'm the Assistant Director to Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. I've been here with the town for about 10 years, well nine, and I'm also one of the community participation officers. Um, so yes, Becky, we can go to the next slide. So the town of Amherst is committed to advancing equity and creating a welcoming community. And the town council in 2020 had passed a resolution affirming, commit, affirming commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity. So the town here is um, committed and the DEI department, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department was a department that was really created through push from the community members with the Community Safety Working Group, who kind of really instilled that the town needed to do something to become more inclusive and, and to achieve equity for all of its residents. 
And so as a result of that, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Department is a department of two right now. It's myself as the assistant director, and then we have a director, Pamela Young, who will start on July 5th. So we're all very excited to have her come and join our team. And the next slide, the work that we'll be working on will be to develop goals, strategy, strategies, and performance measures. I'm gonna open it up on my side too. To meet the town's work toward equity, we will also improve decision-making to be more inclusive of the community and to improve trust in local government. Next slide. Um, the work, and I'm sorry, that's a little small, is to create a strategic plan with implementation measures recommending best practices and equity and inclusion. We will review existing town policies, procedures, bylaws, values, goals, missions, and practices, support human resources in recruiting and, retrain and retaining a diverse workforce. We will provide training and resources for current staff and boards and committees. We'll also serve on hiring committees and interview teams, and we will create outreach and build relationships with the BIPOC businesses and communities. And the work will continue. Um, the human, the DEI director will also be the human rights director, and will provide staff support to Human Rights Commission, the African Heritage Reparations Assembly, the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, Disability Access Advisory Committee, and any other committees that are assigned, as well as support the staff-led core equity team. So the town has a core equity team, which is a group of town staff who also highly feel strongly about um, the town being responsible in creating an inclusive and, an inclusive and welcoming community. And um, that's that's really the DEI department. My little slides, and just wanted to open up to see if anybody had any questions or comments. Okay. Well, that was my part. Thank you. Thank you. We'll also have um, we'll have time for questions and discussion um, after. Um, the next presentation, which is Haley Bolton from the Senior Center. Um, so Haley, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you. Um, all right, awesome. So Amherst Senior Services. Um, Want to talk a little bit about the different programs and activities that we have going on at the Senior Center, and then a little bit about how we stay engaged with the community. I think one of the core um, programs that we offer are programs relating to food. Um, so we, through a partnership with the Food Bank of Western Mass, we offer a monthly brown bag service. We also have our own in-house emergency food pantry for folks who need um, you know, assistance with any kind of meal preparation. Uh, we'll be working with uh, UMass Amherst to reinstate our UMass Meals on Wheels program. Um, so we'll be re relaunching that later this year. And that's a really fantastic program for folks who are homebound and not able to prepare their own meals. We can send it directly to their door. Um, we also partner with Highland Valley Elder Services. Um, again, we have another Meals on Wheels programs for our homebound seniors. And then we also offer a Monday th uh, through Friday to-go lunch. And that takes the place of what had been a congregate dining. So the to-go format is a COVID uh, change. And then we can also refer individuals to the Amherst Survival Center. Um, they now deliver uh, monthly groceries to seniors. So they, a senior can get about seven days worth of meals through the Amherst Survival Center. Um, we also offer a number of supportive services. So when folks need application assistance, help applying to SNAP and fuel assistance, um, we are able to offer licensed social work counseling. Um, if people need help with computers, we have computer tutors, we do income tax preparation. We have a tax work off program here through the town where eligible seniors can reduce their property tax bill by $1,500 um, by volunteering for the town. Um, we can refer people to Hampshire County Veteran Services. They're located just across the hall um, from the senior center offices at the Bain Center. And then we also have a legal clinic. Um, so we are joined uh, once a month by a lawyer uh, and people can get uh, consultations um, with him on whatever things they might have going on. 
And then we can also refer to other partner agencies. So again, we utilize Highland Valley Elder Services quite a bit, um, but if people needed support on handyman type repairs, um, transportation services, we, you know, we can point them in the right direction. Um, and another key component of the senior center is socialization. So we like to offer fun activities. You know, we, we know our seniors like to enjoy themselves. Um, so that can take the form of arts and crafts classes, painting, um, clay, macrame, and, and more. Um, we do therapeutic music programs, um, you know, if, whether that's singing outside or having a performer come to the senior center. Um, we offer a myriad of group fitness classes. Um, we do educational programs. Uh, coming up in, you know, in August, we'll be talking about black holes and we'll do presentations on dunes and geography. Um, trips, we offer trips, uh, you know, places we used to go were Maine, um, the flower show in Boston and trips to New York City. And so later this year, again, we'll be reinstating all those um, programs. And then we do community events. We have a number of volunteer opportunities at the senior center. We've got a book club, we have games um, all on a drop-in basis. Um, and then as Becky mentioned earlier, we are also in the planning stages of uh, a memory cafe. And we are looking for people who might wish to serve on that committee. So if anyone here is interested, just shoot me an email because um, we're looking to get that set up for, for people sometime this fall. Uh, we offer a number of health and wellness programs. We have a caregiver support group led by um, Helen McMillan, who is the social worker here on staff at the Senior Center. Uh, we have SHINE counselors available to people who are trying to navigate the health insurance world. Um, we do a number of wellness workshops on topics ranging from aging in place, dementia care, Medicare, diabetes, um, and then you can find health services here at the Senior Center. We do a monthly foot clinic. We do nail health, uh, blood pressure monitoring, hearing aid cleaning, and Reiki sessions. Uh, and more. Um, in May, we did a um, chair massage clinic, so we do other special programs. Uh, and then the ways that we try to engage with the senior community, uh, primarily through our newsletter, which is available both in print and online. Um, we use the Senior Center and Town of Amherst Facebook pages. Uh, we post on the Town of Amherst calendar, and we really love to refer you to call the Senior Center and talk to a live person. Um, we have volunteers staffing our desk who are more than happy to answer questions on anything you may have regarding the Senior Center. And so one other thing that I would just like to point out is that, you know, I'm fairly new. I started in January, kind of when we were still dealing with a lot of COVID restrictions. Um, so I haven't really gotten to meet as many seniors as I might have liked to. So if people would like to write a letter to the Senior Center, I'd love to hear, you know, what does it mean to you? What programs and activities did you enjoy? What new things would you like to do? Um, you know, we're now kind of at the point where we can scale up our operations and kind of go back to our pre-COVID norms. Uh, so I really want to hear from you and find out what you want and what you'd like in the future. So please send your letters to Amherst Senior Center at 70 Boltwood Walk in Amherst, Mass. And that was it. I'm keeping it short and sweet on my presentation, Becky. Thanks, Haley. Um, so at this point, we have time for questions. And if folks would like to hear more about the community um, participation officers, we can, Angela can get, do her presentation, um, but we can do questions now and, and you know, just say if you wanna hear this other presentation and then we'll, we'll have a group discussion with some, um, some sort of leading questions. So any questions on the presentation so far? There will be a test after, so now is the time to ask your questions. Rosemary. Now, I have a question. Um, Jennifer Moiston mentioned something about um, providing rooms with assisted hearing devices, and I don't know what where those rooms are, but that's something that um, I'm wondering if you've looked at for the Emmer Senior Center, because that's an area where more people have hearing deficiencies than anything. Um, so could you get into that a little bit or answer that question? Is that on the horizon or what, what facilities are being provided with assisted hearing devices? I could speak to that. Um, 
Hi everyone, my name is Maureen Pollock. I'm one of the staff planners with the town. And so uh, this year's um, community uh, um, capital budget for fiscal year 2023 includes um, the purchasing and installation of assisted listening devices for all meeting rooms in the bank center. So that would include the senior center um, as well as the um, other uh, other rooms. So um, that's exciting. I know that um, I, I believe it was Mary Beth that brought that to the attention of um, the planning staff that that was expressed need of users of the bank center and the se senior center. Um, and so um, our IT department and facilities department um, did a walkthrough with a um, audio um, expert um, who recently installed listening devices in Northampton for their uh, for one of their meeting spaces. Um, so he walked us through the bank center and we went into each of the rooms and he gave us um, specific, uh, specific recommendations for each room. So we're gonna be doing a um, request for a proposal sometime in the next couple months to um, to bid that out to so to in order to hire a contractor to come and, and install them um, and then currently there are assisted listening devices in the town room um, which is located in town hall um, and so the technology and those assisted listening devices work really well um, so for someone that has a hearing aid um, for instance um, can just automatically hook up to the uh, assisted listening device there. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anne. Oh, you're mute. Oh, there you go. I, I, two things. One, if we have suggestions about programs we'd like the senior center to offer, um, who do the suggestions go to and how? And two, um, I'm thinking of really safety. Um, I live on Amity Street on the hill where the cars speed up and the sidewalk stops in, on, on one side. Yes. So people who are, e older people who are either walking or who are in some kind of um, wheelchair device don't have enough time to safely cross to the side where there is a sidewalk. Yeah. If one yeah. wanted to see, I have seen several people almost get hit, younger than me who can walk faster than I can. Is there some agency that one can say, hey, could you put one of those push button. push button lights or something in midway on a hill with his speeding? I'm sure this is not the only street that has this problem. I'm only aware of mine, but I don't even know who to address the issue to. Well, that's so it'd be great. Helpful feedback. just to know who to you know who who does one say, "Hey, I've noticed this," and yeah. it would be a big help. I don't well, know where I can. To go um, with it. I can address your first question. So I, uh, as director of senior services, would love to hear what programs you want. And you can email me or you can call me at the senior center. Um, either one is fine. Or you can write that letter um, and just let me know what are you looking for? Because again, you name it and I will try to make it happen. Um, I really like to be creative in terms of the programming that we offer. And I really wanna hear directly from you because I can only plan so much that I think is fun. It's gotta be coming from you too. I already then, have six people that would like to take live Tai Chi outdoors during the summer or during, you know, before it gets icy cold again. Mm. That is a great suggestion. I can I'll... supply you with the class. <laughs> so it comes ready-made then. I like it. Yes, please be in touch about that. So, Anne, my name is Angela Mills, and I work in the town manager's office, and I'm one of your community participation officers, also known as CPOs. And your um, suggestion for that crossing on Amity is a great one. The keepers of the town way, which means roads and sidewalks, are your town councilors. And you live in District 3, so your town mm -hmm. counselors are Dorothy Pam and Jennifer Taub. 
and I can put you in touch with both of them. With I've, your permission, I'd like I'd like to do that for you. I've been in touch. I know Dorothy. I've been in touch with her. She is well aware of this problem. Okay. Has it herself. So <laughs> any changes to the townway have to come. They are the authority. They are the keepers of okay. the townway. It has to happen through the council. Thank you. Yeah, and our next our next forum will be on transportation, um, and also a lot of comments have come out of the survey. So these are the types of things that we will include in the final report. Um, you know, any any suggestions or recommendations. So they'll be there also. Um, and I know the town has a, a transportation committee um, and has worked on a bike and pedestrian network plan. Um, there's, other, there's other opportunities for the town to um, apply for funding to, to develop a complete streets uh, prioritization plan. So these are the types of things we'll talk about at the transportation forum too, but it's, it's definitely okay. something that has come up quite a bit um, in the survey with the open comments. Chris. So I was just going to mention, um, oh, sorry, I had didn't have my microphone. Um, I was just going to mention that the Transportation Advisory Committee meets a couple of times a month, and their meetings are posted on the town website, and they're interested in hearing about issues like this. And usually the um, Director of Public Works attends their meetings, and I attend their meetings. So sometimes... <coughs> These things take a while to happen, but they can bubble up like this, uh, you know, through a, a venue like Transportation Advisory Committee. If somebody comes and mentions it, or if two people come and mention it, then it kind of becomes part of the conversation, and eventually something may happen. So I just wanted to offer that as a suggestion. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions right off or do you want to, um, or, and is anyone, do you want to hear more from Angela about the community preservation or community participation officers? Um, if not, we can go right into breakout discussions. Rosemary's nodding her head. <laughs> Angela, do you want to just talk a little bit more about that? And then um, we still have time for, for a breakout for a discussion. Absolutely. So we have a PowerPoint that we did that was really extensive for the council. Um, it's important to note that community participation officers were written into the new um, home rule charter. So we were the brainstorm of those people on the committee who helped um, redefine and reorganize town government. There are three of us, Jennifer, Brianna and I serve as your CPOs. And we um, serve, we were appointed by Paul Bachelman, the town manager, and we serve the needs of the town many different ways. So all three of us live in town. All three of us have children in the public school system. Um, two of us attended UMass. One of us attended Amherst College. Um, I am bilingual. I grew up speaking Spanish at home. My parents are from Argentina. And so the three of us um, have attended lots and hosted many different events like the inauguration of our town councilors and coffee meetups with the town manager and town manager office hours. We've attended and facilitated capital planning listening sessions and district meetings with your town councilors, budget forums. We recently hosted a pretty successful community cleanup with over 150 volunteers. Um, so those are just an example of the things that we've been busy doing. We also all volunteer for lots of um, not-for-profits. I uh, was one of the co-chairs for the Parent Guardian Organization. Jennifer is currently on the PGO at the high school um, and at the regional level. Brianna's on the board of many different organizations. So we're all engaged, not just in Amherst, but in the greater Pioneer Valley community. Um, as we look forward, in addition to cultural events and flag raisings and supporting the council and supporting the town manager's office, um, we're really looking ahead and hoping to better identify the challenges and the limitations that exist for people to join civic um, boards and committees. We're also trying to discover and connect community partners and who they are and where they are and meet them as they are and help them get involved. And then we really hope to every year outline our goals 
and plan for um, the future development of a more engaged civic organization. So that's kind of CPOs in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think stewardship is at the heart of everything that we do. And we all really feel strongly that this is a very vibrant community. And we hope that we're always putting our best foot forward. Thanks, Angela. Any questions for Angela? Um, if not, I'll get into the um, what we were what we had for breakout room discussions. Um, just share that. So the questions I have are pretty general. Just um, have you or other or older adults that you know, have know um, experienced any challenges in communications, civic engagement, or social inclusion? Um, and are there areas where you think the town could improve their efforts to um, and engage or include older residents? Um, and then what do you think is on top for the town to address in the next three to five years? So I'm just going to stop sharing and um, I will take notes if people have have comments and um, have any any thoughts on those questions. See, Jen. Um, could you maybe put the questions in the chat? Sure. Just so folks, I've already forgotten what the okay. <laughs> first one was. So the first one is just, um, have you or older adults that you know experienced any challenges um, in with communications or civic engagement or social inclusion? Sorry, my mouse is doing funny things, so, okay, I will. And if you have any other general thoughts too, that's fine too. Um, it doesn't have to be specific to this, these topics. I guess one question I have, I, Maureen talked about the um, devices for hearing impaired. Are there any initiatives for people, and maybe Haley, you know, um, people with visual impairments? Um, like sometimes there's, you know, audio books. I know the library probably has some of those, but um, sometimes there's other devices that um, help people who are losing their eyesight. Cause that's that's also something that happens quite a bit with, with people as they get older. Anne, Anne and Rosemary, <laughs> go ahead, Anne. Yeah. Um, I had a very peculiar experience. I have a daughter who was uh, legally blind and um, I gave her what I thought were good instructions to walk to the middle school from Clark House without realizing that I had scouted a sidewalk you know, and I said, turn left and stay on that side and take, keep the sidewalk. And she called me in a panic because the sidewalk ended. Her guide dog stopped. There was no more sidewalk. She didn't know which way to direct the guide walk dog to go. And so I came with a car. You know, she's fortunate she had me available and saw that the sidewalk ended and there was another sidewalk on the other side of the street, which she of course had no way of seeing, no way of knowing that it was there. And even if she did, there was no zebra crosswalk that would have enabled her to cross. So I've done a little driving around and seen that we have a really very peculiar system of sidewalks ending without any notice at all. And I, 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 only because I have personal experience with someone who can't see, um, I don't know how many older people also who are, you know, engaged in walking around town 
find themselves on an unfamiliar street without without any warning that <laughs> there isn't going to be passage. So I think I'm pointing that out as a problem. And it's again, one of these problems that is probably town wide. And somebody needs to kind of take a look at that and where one does have to cross a road to get to a sidewalk again, then there needs to be a crosswalk. Thank you. Um, Rosemary had her hand up and then I'll go to you, Sarah. Yes, um, also on the, along the lines of visually impaired, um, people with visual impairment in the center of town at the main um, crossing where North Pleasant and Amity and Main Street all meet, um, there's no sound signal for those who have visual impairment to know when they can cross the street. And I think that's, um, you know, could be a real problem for someone in that situation. Um, there had been a sound signal when the lights were first put in. And I talked with um, the department about it a number of times and nothing has been fixed. So it would be nice if that could be restored. And I think that's a huge safety, safety issue. Thank you. Karen. Hi, uh, I'm a member of Disability Access Advisory Committee. And these are some of the issues that we are working with the town to resolve. The um, audio signals uh, is a big uh, problem and we have brought it up several times, but I will make sure that it is handled again prior, properly. And also, uh, Rosemary, I was wondering if there is any way you can maybe join one of the Disability Access Advisory Committee meetings and talk about these sidewalks because we don't really know where it exists. And two of our members are visually impaired. One is blind and one is visually impaired. So we really give high importance to solving these problems. And we'll be happy to work on these issues. Furthermore. <laughs> Thank and Maureen is, Maureen is our uh, town representative and she's present in all our meetings. So she's fully aware. Maybe she might want to add a few things to my comments. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Saren. Yes, yeah, so um, as Saren indicated, um, yes, the Disability Access Advisory Committee and I have been talking about um, the existing conditions uh, at some of the um, controlled uh, crosswalks and the audible components. And um, from time to time, the, the audible components go out. And so it's, it's, they were installed, they worked, and over time they become sort of maintenance problems. And so DPW has tried to fix them and, um, they uh, actually another capital budget item that was approved for this year is to um, conduct an inventory of all audible um, beacons at these um, at crosswalks that have these audible components and to assess uh, whether they're working properly or not and what needs to be fixed or does it just need to be um, replaced completely. And I believe the budget will include um, the, the repair work or uh, replacement of them. Um, so that is something that the town is aware of and um, will be doing this um, inventory and upgrades in the next year. Um, so um, thank you. Uh, so it's really the, all the good work of the Disability Access Committee to sort of uh, shepherd people to 
uh, make these uh, decisions of like uh, uh, making their voices heard. That this is something that is important to so many people, not just those that have uh, that are blind or visually impairment. It's also really helpful for you know people that uh, are uh, you know that have strollers or are walking their bike across the street. Or so in essence, it's for everyone um, from. Uh, doesn't mad, matter your age or your ability, um, these things should be working properly. So um, that's something that the town will be um, actively working on this year. Thanks, Maureen. Um, anyone else, anyone, any other areas you think the town could in, improve on these efforts? And, and what's your, I guess, what's your impression of of, of all these things that have been going on over the last couple of years and the technology. And you wanna... um, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, to put this um, so that it sounds constructive. <laughs> um, I think there are many things that um, uh, older people in town have, find themselves having difficulties with. And it very much is a, a almost a, an economic level thing. In other words, some of us have enough money to hire a gardener or a handyman to do things we can no longer do, but we don't have access to who, you know, a list of people other than going online and then your mailbox is just filled with people you've never met and you have no recommendation to, you know, and it, it just goes on and on and it takes much, much time. And then it, it occurs to me, since I can afford to pay for somebody to help me, the number of people whose budgets are tighter than mine who can't afford to pay somebody to help them and I know that um, Amherst Neighbors has a volunteer situation. That hmm, it's not an immediate thing. I think most of us who are older confront daily new issues that we didn't know we couldn't do. We're just finding out how to negotiate aging. And um, having systems that are slow to respond. I think when you don't have a lot of days and years ahead of you, patience with we'll get to that is very slow. So uh, I see that we've got a lot of young people who are in positions of wanting to be helpful. I'm just pointing out to you that most of your aging population doesn't know when they wake up in the morning what it is that they're going to have a great need of because they could do it yesterday and they can no longer do it. <laughs> so I'm looking for, for some way that we as a town can become a little more immediately responsive. As you all know, Amherst has a and has a reputation of studying things to death and appointing people to deal with things. And, you know, it all happens That's gradually right in a period of time. That's right but I don't have that much time ahead of me. And I think I'm speaking for most people. I'm in my 80s. For most people my age, we haven't got the time for the town to study how to fix it. <laughs> we need the fix a little sooner than the study. And I see someone else, <laughs> two other people my own age or, or maybe a little younger, understanding yeah. that um, <laughs> what we could have patience for in our 40s, in our 80s, you know, the planning is different yeah. and the, the patience with this will get solved by next year. I mean, it's like the man who said to me when he re-roofed my house, do you want a 20-year roof or a 40-year roof? <laughs> and my husband said, 
I don't buy green bananas. What a question <laughs> that is for somebody yes. our age. So I think what I'm kind of putting out there is that um, I hope you're going to find ways to be more immediately, or, and when I say immediate, I don't mean tomorrow, but I mean within, let's say, a several month period rather than a several year period when older people bring to your attention that there are problems with negotiating traffic or the street or the whatever. I, I, it's, um, I do volunteer work and I find that lots of people don't speak up. It's con in New England, it's considered not really good to complain mm -hmm. so or be noisy. So I'm being noisy for them right now and telling you there are a heck of a lot of people behind closed doors who are just gnashing their teeth with the pace at which the town finds a solution to a problem that somebody has brought up. Thank you. Sharon. I totally share your view, views and working in town committees for a long, long time. And many important things are put on hold because waiting for some grants to be approved and money could be allocated for that. In my opinion, there should be some funds that could be used depending on the priority of uh, or the importance of the problem. Like there are some sidewalks and we have to wait for a long time before a, a grant kicks in and then they're going to do all the town sidewalks. So I totally agree with the frustration because I am also uh, an old person. And on top of all of that, I have mobility impairments and sidewalks are the biggest challenge for me. And transportation is another one, of course. Parking places, finding proper parking places. That's why I cannot join the activities of at Banks Community Center. Thank you. I have only one more thing that I didn't remember to bring up. And that is, again, an economic thing. I pay someone to clear my sidewalk of snow because I can afford to. What about all of the older homeowners who are responsible for clearing <laughs> snow and can't. It's a problem. That's an issue that comes up in many communities. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, that's a huge issue. And um, thank you so much for pointing that out. So I do want to just give a quick mention to a program that had been suspended due to COVID at the Senior Center. And that was a partnership that we had with UMass where we would bring in um, fraternity members to come and do things like raking leaves or sh shoveling snow. Um, that's a wonderful program. And it's certainly something that I would like to build upon and reinstate. You know, there's a number of things that we had been doing before COVID that we're not doing any longer. Medical rides uh, comes to mind pretty quickly on that. Um, so I think that some of that frustration might just be the senior center, you know, we need to catch up and get back to where we had been. And that's a long process. And that's an even longer process when you have someone new at the helm. Um, but I do thank you for being that voice. And because I think it is I think you're absolutely right. People don't really want to rock the boat, but if you don't rock the boat, we don't know there's an issue. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you stay tuned to the Senior Spirit newsletter. I mean, that that's the way we're going to communicate any new programs, any new services. Um, and there you go. You've got it in the mail. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and so again, I, I do want to strengthen our partnerships with UMass and see if we can reinstate some of those programs or recruit new volunteers who are younger and can offer that service. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Chris. So I just wanted to mention that this type of forum, as well as the Transportation Advisory Committee and other committees, do 
they're good forums. They, people listen, people hear what you say. And then um, the planning department actually, um, you know, comes across these grant opportunities. And I know you talk about those taking a while, but um, sometimes they can be pretty effective. And if we know there's a problem in a particular location, like say Kellogg Avenue, well, the sidewalks there have been in really bad shape for a long time. So last year we asked to have our community development block grant money, part of it used for replacement of those sidewalks. And, you know, that was because we'd heard over time that people really had trouble with that. Um, and there are other things. Maureen has um, gotten money to replace crosswalks in the center of town. And I think that was through an MOD grant, but I'm not absolutely sure. So, you know, she became aware of that because people mentioned it. And it does take time, but, you know, we are listening. And when we hear these things, you know, and a grant opportunity comes up, we'll say, oh, maybe we could use this grant opportunity to fix that problem. The town itself doesn't always have the money that you know, discretionary pot of money to do these things. But when we see an opportunity, we can grab some money and, and do it. And I'm sorry that it does take time, but I just wanted to say that your voices are heard and we do, you know, take in what you're saying. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I want to make sure anyone who hasn't spoken has, um, if there's anything, any, any other concerns or, um, Thoughts? See, Renaud or, or Tracy or Audrey, Dennis. <laughs> Feel free to unmute if you have any comments or thoughts. Okay. Um, I have. A few more survey results I'm, I can share if folks would like to see those. Give me a nod. Okay. Um, let me just see that. So as you're all probably aware, we, we had this survey, um, the Asian Dementia Friendly, um, the Livable Amherst Community Survey. Um, and as I said, we got 875 responses. Um, many people um, were concerned about social isolation and that, you know, a, a lot of that was due to COVID, um, but it is a big issue. Um, we also broke down those responses by age and it was pretty interesting. It was really across the board about sort of the same proportion in each different age group. So um, about a third of all respondents um, were somewhat concerned, the orange, um, the blue is not concerned, and the gray is very concerned. So a few more in the 60 to 69, 70, 79, and 80 to 89 were, were very concerned. Um, but social isolation has come up a lot um, due to the pandemic. Um, we also asked if people um, are caregivers for other people that, um, you know, caregiving is, is something that can really um, affect one's life along with, you know, you might have some, um, some barriers to participation, but you're also a caretaker for your spouse or child. Um, and many people put down other um, as they were caregivers for more than one person. So some people are caregivers for grandchildren as well as their parents um, and maybe, you know, in their 60s or 70s themselves. Um, so people who were caregivers, the people that they take care of most had um, mobility impairments, um, memory loss and forgetfulness um, were higher in this than, than people themselves that have these conditions. Sensory impairment, again, uh, visual or hearing impairment, um, about 18% had were taking care of someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, um, and 33% had um, memory loss, um, and then 25% some other psychological condition. Um, there was a question about uh, additional barriers that caregivers face. 11.5% um, experienced problems at work, 9.4% experienced financial difficulties, 
um, and 18.7% said they needed some kind of respite care so they could get away from the house and do things themselves. Um, this is a question about where people get their information. Um, almost, so 78.7% said the Amherst Senior Center um, family or friends was the next highest. Amherst Neighbors was pretty high um, and a doctor or healthcare provider. And then a really good number, 51% said general internet search. So um, again, Amherst is, is pretty unique in having a lot more older people who are very comfortable with technology. Uh, we asked about programs or services that people ac accessed at the senior center in the last 12 months. Um, the numbers were fairly low, 74% said, said they didn't access any of these services. Um, and we asked why um, some people weren't interested or said they participated in programs elsewhere. Um, we did get a lot of other responses. Um, and I think most people said COVID, you know, which is understandable. Senior Center was closed for some of the time um, and people just weren't interested in online programming. Um, we hope people come back um, once the center is, is fully open and, and even now. Um, many people also had comments about the senior center itself, um, too small, depressing, ugly, confusing, not inviting. Um, and then people said parking was difficult, which we've heard today. Um, and other people just said they didn't need the services yet. Um, we asked if evening programs were offered, would people be more likely to attend? And almost 23% said yes. Um, if we look at the ages, uh, those who said yes were generally the younger, younger, older people. So people who are probably still working between, you know, in the 50s and 60s and some in the 70s. Um, the older, older folks were not interested um, in the evening programming. And then there were 299 responses on how the Amherst Senior, Senior Center could better meet your needs. And Haley has all this information and um, we're working on sort of trying to compile it um, into different categories. Um, but there were a lot of really great uh, recommendations or comments. Um, so engaging people across lifespan, um, new senior center, memory cafes, um, more parking, very cultural programs, fit, more fitness programs, um, topics of interest, some of those are already um, like end of life, legal basics, med medical resources, um, make the senior center more environmentally friendly, have bilingual discussion service circles um, and programs in other languages, more trips and educational programs um, and strategies for memory loss. Um, so next steps, we have another session scheduled for July 25th. I hope that date is correct, I believe it is, um, on Monday. And I believe at this point, we are thinking it's still going to be online, but let me stop sharing right now and just make sure. Um, does online still work for people or, or are people interested in, in being, you know, trying to, to have something in person? Oh, you're muted, Anne. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I've tried to do a couple of public forums in other communities, and and I think people are still not comfortable going out. So um, we'll try the next one in person too. And and um, I think we're gonna put something on the website that you know if people do have problems working with Zoom, we can try to work with people um, to get them involved also. But transportation, I think, is going to be a big draw because we'll be we'll be talking about services as well as the sidewalks and um, infrastructure. So um, I think that's that's going to get a lot of interest. So any other questions or thoughts where we can end a little early? Um, I really appreciate you all for participating. I hope next time uh, um, 
email goes out about a reminder because I think more people would be attending for the transportation, especially. Yeah, and we can also do it that we don't require registration. We can just provide a Zoom link. Do you think that would be easier to? Yeah, okay. And okay. when you do that, you can also do like a, a week reminder, a day re reminder, and then like a, I think it's like an hour reminder. Very helpful. Yeah. 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 So the problem is with we don't get people to register, then we're sending to everyone Everybody. on the list. And so, yeah, we just need to know who to, who to send those reminders to. Do you also let the Amherst neighbors know about these uh, forums? Yeah, and I'm not sure. Um, yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. We'll make sure they they send reminders out to that list too, because that's yeah. a big list. I sometimes if people register, it's more of a commitment kind of thing. Um, they have to register pretty far in advance, but then if they get reminders, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. It, it occurs to me that. That once you register, you've probably put it in your calendar. Yes. And yes. Um, Correct. It, I, I'm okay. I when when too much material uh, appears in one's mailbox from a particular group of people, um, one tends not to look at it anymore. Now, I'm, I'm talking as a communications professional. Sometimes it's not a great idea to do reminder after reminder after reminder because they won't open the mail. It's the same, you know, the same in print media or, or other media. If, if there's too much on the bulletin board, you stop reading anything. So please be careful about yes. too many communications. Chris. So are you worried about, um, this is a question for Becky and I guess Maureen and ha Haley also. Um, are you worried about Zoom bombers if you send a link to everybody? And if you are worried about that, could you set this up in a way that certain people are made panelists and other people are invited to be attendees and the attendees can be recognized individually if they raise their hands, you're not gonna be able to see them. So that is a problem, but I don't know. I mean, that's how the planning board does it. The planning board invites some people as panelists and then there's a whole, there could be like 40 attendees. And if someone raises their hand, they get recognized to say what they have to say. So I don't know if you've considered those other kinds of formats. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have that capability on my Zoom, and I've, I've never had an issue with Zoom bombers. I kind of prefer to be able to see people rather than having them in the background for something like this, just because I think if, if you see faces, people are more likely to participate. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I know that can be an issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the main thing is, you know, if this is on Engage Amherst, you know, people see it there, but we don't necessarily know who to email with reminders um, other than Amherst neighbors and, you know, the, the obvious choices. Um, may be able to do both registration and send a Zoom link. I'm not sure. We'll have to, we'll have to look into that. Um, okay. Well, thank you all for your input and um, look forward to seeing you in July if you'd like to attend that one and please tell your friends. Um, we will, uh, the poster right now says it's gonna be at the Bang Center. So we'll, we'll change that on the website to make sure people are not going to the Bang Center. Thank you, Becky. So it's going to be a Zoom meeting? Yeah, I think we've- Or I think in we've, person? I think we've decided it's going to be Zoom, right, Haley? Yeah. Okay. We're going to stick with this format, but hopefully do it in okay. a way that we can get people uh, some reminders so they can come and attend. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. See you later. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.